Hello, hello there, COB. Welcome back to our 30-day challenge online. And today we will be finishing up in our First Corinthians. It is awesome to fill ourselves with the living, abiding word of God. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. We hear God's word and we believe it. That is the lesson from that verse. It is so powerful to hear the Word of God. Once again today, our pastors will be reading for us from our New Testament passage. Are you ready? Let's go! Good day, I am Pastora Christelle Vendas, and I will be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 to 10. Let us start. Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I am not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share with your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us, as the other apostles, and the Lord's brothers do, and as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? What soldier has to pay his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruits? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking only about the oxen when he said this? Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us, so that the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, Aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? If you supported others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple? And those who serve at the altar gets a share of the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Yet I have never used any of these rights. And I am not writing this to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. What then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. Even though I am free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too live under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law, so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, 
I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself must be disqualified. Chapter 10 I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on the dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble as some of them did and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as example for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than what you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. So, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I am saying is true. When we bless the cup of the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? What am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. What? Do we dare to rouse the Lord's jealousy? Do you think we are stronger than He is? You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever it is offered without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you, this meat was offered to an idol, do not eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is for the other person.
For why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I, too, try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachings I have passed on to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshipping. For man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory. And woman reflects man's glory. For the first man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. For this reason, and because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. But among God's people, women are independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy? For it has been given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this, and neither do God's other churches. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. For I pass on to you. What I received from the Lord himself on the night when he was with prayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if you examine yourselves, we who would not be judged by God in this way, yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So my dear brothers and sisters, 
When you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about the other matters after I arrive. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshipping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, but another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and the only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. But if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts where we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. While the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body. And each of you is a part of it. Here are some parts God has appointed for the church. First apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we have the gift of healing? Do we have all the ability to speak unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best for all. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 If I could speak all the languages of earth 
and of angels, but did love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possess all knowledge, and if I had such faith that could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown language and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought, and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Chapter 14. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but the one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish he could all speak in tongues. Even more, I wish he could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how should that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. Even lifeless instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly, or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they are being called to battle? It's the same for you. If you speak to people in words they don't understand, how will they know what you are saying? You might as well be talking to an empty space. There are many different languages in the world, and every language has meaning. But if I don't understand a language, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it, and the one who speaks it will be a foreigner to me. And the same is true for you. Since you are so eager to have special abilities the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying but I don't understand what I am saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God, only the Spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying? You will be giving thanks very well, 
but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you, but in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but be mature in the understanding of this kind. It is written in the scriptures, I will speak to my own people through strange languages and through the lips of foreigners, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church meeting and hear everyone speaking in a known language, they will think you're crazy. But if all of you are prophesying and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time, and someone must interpret what they say. If no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. Let two or three people prophesy, and let others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying, and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns, for God is not a God of disorder but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. Women should be silent during the church meetings. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive, just as the law says. If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. Or do you think God's word originated with you, Corinthians? Are you the only ones to whom it was given? If you claim to be a prophet or think you are spiritual, you should recognize that what I am saying is a command from the Lord himself. But if you do not recognize this, you yourself will not be recognized. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues, but be sure that everything is done properly and in order. 1 Corinthians 15 Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out His special favor on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I 
but God who was working through me by His grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ had not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, then your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. That if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when He comes back. After that, the end will come when He will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until He humbles all His enemies beneath His feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scripture says, God has put all things under His authority. Of course, when it says all things are under His authority, that does not include God Himself, who gave Christ His authority. Then when all things are under His authority, the Son will put Himself under God's authority, so that God, who gave His Son authority over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. If the dead will not be raised, what point is there in people being baptized for those who are dead? Why do it unless the dead will someday rise again? And why should we risk our lives by hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. This is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts? Those people of Ephesus, if there will be no resurrection from the dead. And if there is no resurrection, let's feast and drink, for tomorrow we die. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Think carefully about what is right, and stop sinning. For to your shame I say that some of you don't know God at all. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question! When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. Then God gives it the new body He wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. One kind of for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in the heavens and bodies on the earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and stars each have another kind. Then even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scriptures tells us, the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. 
What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of the week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along, they can travel with me. I am coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia, for I am planning to travel through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay a while with you, possibly all winter, and then you can send me on my way to my next destination. This time I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while. If the Lord will let me in the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. When Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. He is doing the Lord's work just as I am. Don't let anyone treat him with contempt. Send him on his way with your blessing. When he returns to me, I expect him to come with other believers. Now about our brother Apollos, I urged him to visit you with the other believers. But he was not willing to go right now. He will see you later when he has the opportunity. Be on guard, stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. You know that Stephanas and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece. And they are spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. I am very glad that Stephanas, Fortunatus, and Achaeus have come here. They have been providing the help you weren't here to give me. They have been a wonderful encouragement to me as they have been to you. You must show your appreciation to all who serve so well. The churches here in the promise of Asia send greetings in the Lord, as do Aquila and Priscilla, and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings. All the brothers and sisters here send greetings to you. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. Here is my greeting my own handwriting. Paul, if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Our Lord, come, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you. In Christ Jesus. Thank you for being a part of the 30-Day Challenge. What a beautiful way to grow our faith, to encourage ourselves in the Word, to read through the entire New Testament in 30 days. Now, I know we're in the epistles now, and that's a little rougher reading than just reading through the Gospels and reading through the stories of the book of Acts. But take your time, maybe do part in the morning, part in the evening when you get home, and then as following a refresher, listen as we read it to you each night. 
We're going into a weekend again. I want to encourage you. If you can be here, be here safely. We've got the new Cayenta campus also open. So again, if you can be in one of the campuses, be there. If you can't be there, then be there and drive in. If you can't be there and drive in, well, be there online. And let's just worship the Lord together. Let me pray for you. Father, I lift you to your people tonight. I ask, Lord, for healing and strength. Father, many of them are still suffering with the coughs and things. Lord, in the name of Jesus, restore all lungs to full health in Jesus' name. Let all of these coughs leave. Let the fevers be gone. And let strength be in the bodies of your people. And Father, let discouragement leave the hearts of your people. Father, you have so much for your people to accomplish. So many goals, so many plans and dreams for each of their lives. Let them begin to see that none of those things have stopped. None of those things have gone away. Satan can delay, but he can never deny. Lord, move them toward their goals. Teach them how to begin to move forward. Lead them in a straight path for your name's sake. And Lord, let prosperity flow to their hands. Let these be days, Lord, when long sales that they've worked on, deals and transactions they've worked on for long times, let these be days where those come to pass. Father, all the work that they put in, let these be the days that all of that fruit is born. Father, let there be promotions in the offices. But Father, we ask that you bless the work of all of your people's hands. And Father, bless every family with peace. I know the lockdowns are hard again with the work from home and the school from home and people not allowed out of the house that don't have vaccines. And Father, the frustration levels are getting higher. Let your love and let your peace come upon every home, Father. Upon every home. Turn the hearts of the fathers and the mothers toward their children. Turn the heart of the children toward their parents. I thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you tomorrow. 30-day challenge.